So good morning, everybody. I'm Jason Davis. I go by JD. Um, I lead up our Blue Cat expert team for Blue Cat. I started at Blue Cat in 2007. Um, so we were about five, five or six years old uh, as, as an organization then. Um, I come from a network engineering background. Uh, I come from a software development background. Um, I was actually on the team that uh, invented the server blade, if you believe that or if you're not. So some folks in here probably remember some of that time frame. I got into consulting after that, and then um, I got into uh, got uh, got hooked up with uh, with Blue Cat, and it's been a very good journey since that time. What's interesting about talking about DNS and the folks that raised their hand? There's more in, there's more network people in here than there are DNS folks, right? By raise of hands, you, I think there was two of you guys, you two guys that had done DNS for corporations, right? Um, and so with that, I did I did networking for a very large organization and then into software. My next stint into uh, networking was for very small organizations, right? Where we did everything. I did everything. I did the firewalls, I did the DHCP, I did uh, back then it was just the beginning of Active Directory. And so while I didn't become an expert in anything or, or uh, I, I became a knowledgeable in all things technology and so I had to to be able to consult. Getting into Blue Cat, uh, what I found at that time was I thought I could take the knowledge or the, the knowledge that I had in terms of just doing basic consulting really lent itself well um, to the space because it wasn't about simply answering queries. Um, it wasn't about handing out leases for DHCP and it really wasn't always about managing the IP space. It was where did we fit in the ecosystem, right? And so what we're gonna talk about a little bit today in terms of enterprise DNS is what is the difference between DDI and enterprise DNS, right? And so if you guys will remember back in 2008, 2009 timeframe, that's when Gartner got into the space and they actually coined that phrase. DDI is theirs. They came up with a networking world uh, clear choice award. And so they compared the four vendors, QIP and Blue Cat and Infoblox and uh, BT at the time. And we actually came out ahead. How we managed to pull that off, I'm not quite sure. I was a rookie back then and, and we, we somehow managed to get on top of that heat. But, but they're the one that coined that phrase because they're the first, we were the first ones, or these four vendors really were the first ones to put those critical services together, right? So if you think about what DD is, DNS and DHCP, that's IP connectivity and resolution, right? IP address management in the 2000 and time frame, 2005 timeframe when Blue Cat got into that space was still thought of as separate. And so you could buy DNS servers by themselves, you could buy DHCP servers by themselves to solve a specific problem around queries per second, or resiliency, or redundancy, or things of that nature that were all client-facing services, right? That was just for the devices on those networks. And IP address management was always for the engineers. They were trying to get away from spreadsheets or text files or Heaven forbid, they were looking in the route tables in ARP cache to do IPAM. If you guys, I'm sure you guys have, have done that before as well. So in this time, it's important to understand the history of where we've come from, the eras that we've gone through in technology, which is why we landed here in enterprise DNS. And so thinking about IPAM for just a second, client services, DNS and DHCP, they haven't changed in 30 years. They really haven't. Um, the biggest change that we can think of or that I can think of as I was preparing for this is uh, the SRV record when AD came around. That was a big change, right? Um, think about DNSSEC being implemented in the 2009 timeframe, but DNSSEC was available back in the 90s, right? And so these eras of time, uh, IPv6 changed the, uh, VoIP changed the IP space. IPv6 changed the, uh, the IP space. What's changed the DNS space? Right, nothing over these, over these years and eras, nothing has really made a, a significant impact to DNS and specifically to these three services that have been clumped together for a very long time. What we found is that when we went to go talk to organizations, the problems that they were having, they were scared about outages. They were scared about, and I won't mention, I will mention, uh, I can mention Microsoft. They were scared about what was happening in terms of outages related to Microsoft, related to DNS or DHCP issues or things of that nature, right? And so resiliency, redundancy, speed, those things were things that we really talked about. Since then, those have become absolute table stakes, right? And so now what we're looking for is a way to, or in this era now, with these th three things being uh, clumped together, now what is changing the market and why in the world, we'll get to it in a few minutes, why in the world would we make a change from the things that we're using today, right? Like Microsoft 
like spreadsheets, like maybe even you're a DDI minded customer already or organization already, maybe you're already using one of the four big vendors or maybe a couple of the small vendors for either IPAM or these services. So why in the world will we make those changes? When we went in and we were successful, we weren't very successful against displacing our competitors. And so we stopped trying. We didn't need to displace our competitors. There was a huge greenfield market for all of these organizations that were using completely disparate tools and services and management uh, uh, technologies for these three different things. What we tried to do was boil the ocean, quite frankly. We tried to go in and say, you know what? If you're using Microsoft, if you're using Bind, come use BlueCat. We will spread across your entire organization globally, right? And you will become unified and you'll be blue cat across the world and you can save the world, right? What we found was we became a part of the problem, right? We became, we were making even more disparate environments when we thought like that because we might, we might go ahead and implement completely in Europe. We might implement completely in, in North America or anywhere else, but we never got global because they never had a reason to go global, right? And so now we were another vendor. We were another technology. We were something else that they had to manage, another place to go, to go get data, create services, do management. And we never got to the actual leveraging of those infrastructures. We always just managed the services themselves. And so if you think about what it is, again, DDI is all connectivity and resolution, which is all client facing. It's very complex and error prone and not because the tools are bad, but because when you create a disparate environment, you've got to hand off from one environment to the other, especially in DNS, right? And so with that, if I'm using Microsoft and I have to forward over to bind and I have to then forward out to wherever I need to go, it's not the configuration that's the problem, it's the management of the configuration that becomes the issue. And so therefore, when we start talking about what enterprise DNS is, enterprise DNS it relates all three. It is DDI, but it is a unified platform across the board, right? To eliminate those uh, chances of errors, to eliminate the issues with not being able to automate. We'll get into some of those things uh, in a minute. <coughs> but the number one key value driver, in my opinion, I don't know that anybody has said this, else, probably have, I don't know. My number one key value driver is visibility and control. And so what does that mean? In a, in a space where I am the single source of truth of everything in the IP space and everything in the name space, then I get a 30,000 foot view of what my networks are. I get a very low level understanding of what's on my network. And now in this era of DNS, I get to understand what the intentions of all of those devices are through DNS. The only way to achieve that level of visibility and control is to completely unify across the board. Right? Question. Is that, I've been waiting for that sentence to say that that's what your, that's what the main theme is. So you're talking about the unification of those services, because I remember using uh, Blue Cat on a huge global scale like six, seven, eight years ago, and it was great. And I'm trying to figure out now, it's 1025, what, what's the angle of what you're doing today? The angle of what we're doing is not just unifying the services. It is treating DNS and DHCP and IP address management as one single solution that can be leveraged for something far more meaningful than just the client facing services. And it was your next slide. So it worked out. Perfect question, perfect Very timing. Good. Okay. And this theme has uh, <coughs> my attention because what I've personally experienced in troubleshooting settings is a disconnect between the Microsoft DNS world being used for DHCP and the enterprise outward facing DNS based on Linux or whatever or a pro a product, and in particular, problems caused by rever gaps in reverse lookup. A hundred percent. So here's what's interesting about the, the thought. In, in my experience in talking with customers, and I'm client facing, um, for, the, for the most part at BlueCat, I've been uh, out in the field talking with our customers, talking with uh, small customers and large customers alike. The biggest misconception is that Microsoft is a unified platform. And, and no offense to Microsoft, but these services within, they live within Microsoft, but they are in no way, shape, or form connected. Forwards, forwards and reverse are not connected. Uh, management of any kind is not connected. And in fact, there's no interaction between the IP space and the namespace at all outside of the connection of DHCP, right? But once that handoff has been done, then it's forgotten about, right? And so one of the things that is most important about this unified solution is that it is an ecosystem of standing up and taking down, right? So uh, in that 
you know, when I talk about table stakes of the services themselves, you bring up a great point. So even though a record might go into Microsoft in the, in the forward space and in the reverse space, they're equal at that time, that's the last time they're equal, right? They always go in, they very rarely come out, and then as soon as an A record changes, right, now it's out of sync with its, with its PTR record. And then in no way, shape, or form is that going to get deallocated in an efficient manner, right? And so when you lose now the connectivity between the IP space and the DNS space, for resolution and for management, you've got a big, huge mess. And so in Jim's slide up there, it said DNS is messy. That's part of the reason that it's messy because there's no unification. There's no synchronization be uh, between those services once it's out the door, right? And so when I talk about, or when we talk about enterprise DNS being unified core services themselves, those are all table stakes, unifying it with the management so that we can house this data, the IP space. And I call it the three pillars I have for a long time. The three pillars of data is the IP space, the namespace, and the devices. And BlueCat uniquely ties those three pillars of data together to do something far more meaningful. We'll get into it in a few minutes, but think about this. When I stand up compute, there's a, there are two things that I absolutely have to have for that, cute to, uh, that compute to be accessible. I have to have an IP address, so I have to know where it's going. And I really need to have I actually almost now have to have a name to go with it so I know how to get there. If I don't have those two things, I don't care how fast my virtual infrastructure can stand up VMs or how fast I can stand up a cloud instance, right? I need to be able to get to it and be a part of the entire ecosystem that is this enterprise DNS. Yes, sir. Well, there are other critical dependencies too. I think the traditional view, which a lot of enterprises still have, is I've got to do forward look up, resolve a name into an IP, boom, done. Okay, that seems to be working. I clicked in the GUI. My job is done. But what is turning up lately is that PKI and logging, like database performance for writes, possibly, depend on reverse lookups, which just gets overlooked. Well, and in some cases, authentication, to too. Them. Right? So, it, it, so the, the thought was, actually, um, and, and again, I'm, I'm picking on Microsoft here, but I don't intend to for very much longer. But... The idea here was, well, the reverse space really doesn't matter to me because I'll just call somebody and ask them for what their IP address is if I need to RDP into their box and do some work, right? But anymore, as you're talking about, PKIs and then specifically authentication, apps won't work if you're not resolving properly. And quite frankly, just an understanding of what your networks are, that's what we're going to. And here's why. Time to compute, time to detect are at a all-time high. Right? So with that, we need to be absolutely as accurate as we possibly can with all three of these uh, data elements or the pillars of data that represent enterprise DNS. So why do we shift? Right? Why do we do anything at all? And again, I'll go back to some of the things that we talked about or that I, that I mentioned up front, which was, hey, we are, uh, our, our DNS system is not fast enough. Yes, it is. Our DNS system is not resi uh, resilient enough. Yes, it is. Um, it's not redundant enough. Mm, yeah, it is. I'm sure it is, right? Those are not drivers anymore. They used to be drivers when we were selling these things independent or when folks really didn't have a handle on the core services. Quite frankly, who back in 2005 really thought about DNS or thought about DHCP as a core service, right? Routing was a core service. Other firewalls were core things, right? But DNS and DHCP, those are just supposed to work. So if that's the case, I might as well put them on the router. I might as well put a, a Microsoft box or a bind box out in some environment if I really don't care um, about understanding what that space looks like after it's out, I might as well go throw those out there. So why in the world would I shift from that environment where those are free? Quite frankly, the biggest, uh, Jim mentioned it a while ago, the biggest uh, deterrent to making any change at all is what I have right now is free. Why would I make, why would I go spend any amount of dollars at all on something that I'm getting right now for free? So we'll talk about that. A little bit more about understanding enterprise DNS. I think we've gone through that, but le leveraging now the unified system, this is where the bread and butter of enterprise DNS is. It's not the core services. It is being able to leverage the unification of those core services for some very specific things that we'll talk about. Specifically automation, SD-WAN is huge, SDN and SD-WAN, um, cloud, and then leveraging it to be a part of the defense and depth strategy for security. We're not at all talking about taking over security mechanisms, but adding to that defense in depth. And then quite, quite frankly, uh, in my opinion, or in our opinion as Blue Cat, not even my opinion, 
Our opinion at Blue Cat is that if we can't get you there, if we can't understand your business enough, understand the challenges that you have, and get you from where you are today into what we're talking about going to an enterprise DNS, then we shouldn't be talking at all. And I know at some point you're going to ask me, what is the differentiation between you and your competitors? And in my opinion, in our opinion, it's the bottom one, right? It is engaging with our customers, not just to have them use their imagination on how they can implement these services and leverage this tool. It is showing them, it is talking about how we've done it before with our other very large customers around the globe and getting them into this enterprise DNS and staying with them because this is a very quickly evolving and rapidly evolving era of technology where connectivity is about to change completely, which is gonna change our whole <coughs> thinking on how we provide core services, right? On how we provide DNS, on how we get to the resources that we need to get to, on how to understand what our networks look like, on how to change those networks super, super fast, instantaneously, and not just one, hundreds, or thousands, especially when we move into cloud, right? Or into the SD-WAN project. So that's what we're really going to talk about, why DNS is just as important as the services themselves. By the way, stop for questions. So concerns, questions, are we, uh, is, this, is this resonating? I mean, has this been resonating with your readers, with your corporations? Because this has been resonating with the engagement uh, um, conversations that we've had with our customers. Buy it? Don't buy it? Not monetarily. Get it? <laughs> we'll get to the monetary I mean, part. It's going to be a hard sell for the small and medium business. It's 100% going to be a very hard sell for the small and medium business. That is a great point. Um, quite frankly, um, I don't want to speak for all of Blue Cat here, but you're right. I mean, that if we get into uh, the, the smaller and, and um, the smaller and medium sized businesses just for the core services, they might as well stay right where they are. Or they might go with a vendor who is not focused on leveraging. The difference here though that will, and that's been in the last 10 years, we've noticed the SME market, uh, or the SMB market rather, has been a, uh, a, very, a very hard one to crack into. And so um, the, the folks that are focused on that accounts, they have a battle on their hands a lot. It comes down to features, and it comes down to functionality, it comes down to demos and POCs and price. Right? That's what really drives those projects. What I think is going to change this market now and make the SMB market easier to crack into is the fact that they're still going to SD-WAN. They still need to automate. They're still moving out into the cloud. And in fact, they're probably moving out into the cloud faster because they have less resources to move out there. Right? And they, they bring down their connectivity charges or connectivity costs. And when you do that, now enterprise DNS becomes super relevant for them because now they're leveraging this again, right? So it all comes down, in my opinion, enterprise DNS comes down to leveraging that ecosystem, not just the ecosystem itself. That's a great question, a great point. Any others? Okay, what are we talking about? Visibility and control. Again, I think the DDI market, if we had, if we had been, able to spread, been able to spread globally across, across our customers, I think visibility and control would have been the number one key value driver for DDI, right? I certainly think it is for enterprise DNS. Pervasive automation, we'll get into that. Cloud agility and enhanced security. Let's talk about automation. So of the folks we talked about DNS, how many of you folks on the networking side automate, are already automating your networks? What are you using? What are you, what are you let's do this, what are you doing? What are you automating? Anybody? Standing up VLANs? Self-service for whatever, right? Are those the things we're getting into? Creating yeah, templates for all configuration mm -hmm. based on maybe an IPAM, something like that. For what, for, for routing and switching? Routing, for routing? routing data center switching. And, and what are you using right now for that? Uh, it can be a, well, it's a combination of tools, I guess. Well, we, with a, one of the most well-known tools over there is maybe Ansible and, uh, yep. and uh, the Python. Okay, so, so scripting and an actual tool, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and then what is the, what's the single source in your organization, right? Do you have a single source of truth of the IP space? It depends on the customers that we are. Okay. But, uh, yeah. What, what is it? Uh, it can be uh, uh, some kind of um, some open source, uh, some IPAM. Yep, so, so one of the off-the-shelf maybe, yeah. right? Or, or even a vendor, right? I mean, we get 
quite often we go into some of our older legacy customers and ask them that very question. Are we the single source of truth of your IPAM? Or are we a glorified spreadsheet in the way that you're implementing and using us and leveraging us today? Right, so Ansible, Python, what else? Those are the big ones. Those are the big ones, yeah. right? And so is, is self-service, so you're, I mean, in your, when you go to your customers, is self-service a big thing or just more of the templatizing against virtual, virtual environments? More, most of the time it's basically all templating. Got it. Okay. All right, so we'll get into this. But here's the idea, um, and this is, I, I, I can expect, uh, and I, I expect this question every single time I go stand in front of our, our, any of our customers is, what integrations do you have? What <coughs> out of the box integrations do you have that I can take off the shelf and plug in immediately? And, and the interesting point back to that is that I don't know that I can answer that for you. Every organization is different. And so the approach to automation that we take is also a differentiator, in my opinion, to our competitors, right? So if I build you an out of the box, or if I, if I have an off the shelf or out of the box uh, direct integration with something, you're gonna modify it anyway. And so the approach that we take to automation is a foundation of workflows, a foundation of flexibility in being able to work with just about any of the software solutions that you're using. A big one in self-service, uh, service now, for example, you're talking about automating some processes and templates. We can, the way that we take the, or the approach that we take is to build workflows, right? We will interact back in the very hardcore strict APIs that we've always had against our main management platform. And then we'll build the business logic and workflows, expose a rest, uh, restful endpoint for you guys. And you guys, whatever, whatever service you're using, whatever tools you're using, you give us the pertinent information around the specific thing that you are trying to do or the specific request that you've been given. Let us do the hardcore work back in our data set, give you the relevant inf information back, and then you can move along in the process that you need to create or to fulfill that request. Right, so that's the approach to automation. With that, it gives us a clarification on that. So you, you just described building a workflow. So that is I use the Blue Cat tooling to build a workflow. And then you mentioned uh, exposing a particular endpoint via RESTful API. Does, does that mean I'm not just querying an API and pulling information out of the database based on my workflow, I can customize what the API is giving me? Okay. So in a traditional API model, so we still have both, by the way. So when I get into, when I get into a diagram out here uh, that we'll talk specifically about, I'll show you where that is and I'll show the historical way to do it and the way that we're doing it today in our automation platform, but you're right. So the traditional way is to go against the database itself with an API, a very strict call to the API, maintains referential integrity, maintains the, the, the pertinent security and permissions around our data set to protect our data set in the API call, and you're going to ask me for the next available IP address, yep. right? Very common one, next available network, something like that. Set or give me a host record or an A record for that matter, right? Mm -hmm. You would come in and have to understand within your workflow specifically, whatever you're doing out there, all of the different, for lack of a better phrase, DDI or IPAM pieces, and you have to piece it all together yourself in the different systems that you're using. Say, for example, you're using ServiceNow. Right? And you have a request for a printer, something like that, or a request for a VM, let's go with a VM. Then you'd have to know, I've got to call out over here to the VM infrastructure, I've got to call out to the IPAM platform, I've got to call back out to the IPAM platform for my A record, et cetera, all of the different pieces within our automation platform where we're, ex we're creating that workflow for you. Here's a VM, right? I need a VM, so call into me asking for the workflow that represents give me a VM. And all of the business logic is created inside of that workflow. We spit you back out a yes, no, and the pertinent data, and you can move along, mm. right? So you don't have to know each and every specific Blue Cat API there is. Yeah. And, and then you have to repeat that process with ServiceNow and OpenStack and Ansible and everything else that you're using, you've got to then repeat all of that work. Whereas if we build you the workflow that says, give that to me or create that for me, you only have to do that once in here and create one call back in with the pertinent data. That was the lead, I think, uh, point to come out with that you guys can help uh, automate with a single source of truth. You just described a lot of value right there. So. Yeah, it's, look, I mean, uh, there's, there's all kinds of tools and there's all kinds of customers using all kinds of tools, 
right? And so we're not trying to boil the ocean every single time. It's a lot less headache for us to help you build a workflow that all of the tools that you can use and then let us give it back to the community, right? So that others can consume that or, or use that workflow again, right? Because quite frankly, if you think about, about what BlueCat, if, or if you think about what IPAM is, forget BlueCat for a second. If you think about what IPAM is, think about the data that we hold that's relevant to your automation. We hold blocks, subnets, IP addresses, we hold the namespace, so subzones and zones and, and A records and PTR records. And, and, and in a lot of cases, we, we have the devices that are, that are occupying or allocating IP space on our networks. And that's it, right? I mean, that's the relevant data. You could use us for a whole lot more. You could use us for uh, asset management. You could use us for a whole bunch of different things, and customers are. As we get into SD-WAN, they definitely are. But in, in general, for the base use case of give me an IP address, um, you're just looking for one simple thing, right? But now you've got to do that over and over and over. So we'd rather build that entire business logic for you, let you can consume that, and then we can give it back to the community. Cloud, in my opinion, um, in the, I'm sorry, in the engagements that I'm involved in recently and my team has been involved in recently, and I'll tell you where we fit inside of BlueCat, cloud is probably the number one thing that we talk about. It's, it's definitely the number one thing that my team is focused on, and we're definitely going to get into this. And you might think, well, wow, why is cloud, why, why in the world would I need to talk about enterprise DNS in the cloud? Cloud already has DNS, and that's very true. And that adds to the disparity uh, to more disparate environments. And so as more and more and customers are getting into cloud, the biggest thing, the very first question that I ask them is, what are you doing in the cloud? What is your cloud strategy? What is your C-level CIO? What are the goals of the organization to get to cloud? And where are you? in that journey? Are you 2%? Are you 50%? And, and quite frankly, what are the challenges that you're finding? What we are hearing from our customers, they don't know how to get bi-directional resolution and visibility from on-prem into the cloud and back, right? And so if you think about, and I won't pick on the cloud vendors, um, actually I will here in a minute, but not just yet. Um, but quite frankly, cloud was invented or was created originally to be autonomous. We weren't thinking about extending our corporate networks out in the cloud. I needed compute, I didn't have compute, I went and swiped my card, I got compute, right? I went and I connected however I connected out to the cloud, I got what I needed, I did my development, I got rid of it, I paid for it, I'm done. But anymore, as everybody knows, cloud is now becoming an extension of our corporate networks. And in some cases, the cloud is becoming our corporate networks. And so when we think about the different connectivity models that will drive the next era, in my opinion, uh, or, or, from what we're hearing, not my opinion, but from, from what we're hearing from our customers, the cloud will be the end all be all, whether it's private cloud or the public clouds, that will be where the resources are for the organizations. And we can't rely, we can't rely on the autonomous DNS that is in those clouds. We have to connect it back to our on-prem because our our clients, our own users are looking at the on-prem DNS and they need to be able to resolve out into the cloud. And so we ask them every day, how are you doing that today? It's manual, right? And it's error prone, right? And it's slow and we can't keep up with demand. That's why we're moving to automation and you can't move to automation without a unified platform across the board. So that leads to a good question. Since every source of truth that you could have, um, is a manual process. How do you maintain that on a daily basis to make it accurate? That's a great question. You would think, um, you would think that, oh, well, if I'm going to be the end all um, single source of truth for the IP space, for example, then I better have a good discovery mechanism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I disagree, right? I disagree. I, I think that is part of it, but that's not the end all be all. Time and time and time and time again, we have heard when we come into our customers, we'll just come discover our network, right? How many times can you do that? You can't, you, you're gonna get blocked all over the place when you start trying to discover specifically the IP space in any given <coughs> organization. So here's how we tackle that. We take what you have, we go in and we dig and we do discovery, not, not physical discovery. We go engage with our customers. What tools are you using? What services are you using? What processes are you using? And again, this goes back to Blue Cat's engagement model with our customers to become that single source of truth. Because there is no one single, there is no silver bullet to fire into a network and go get everything that's on that network. You have to work with the teams that are managing those networks and creating those networks. You have to start working on the processes. And so this is much a, 
a process of human as it is tool sets mm -hmm. to say, look, you can circumvent this process if you want to, but there are ramifications if you do so, right? And so you're, you're gonna be able to get around any automated tool if that's your intention to do that. And so we go in, um, I'm not skating the question, I'm actually trying to answer mm -hmm. the question that we, that we engage in here, and that is, give us the data that you have. We can, we can gain some very good insight when we start comparing the IP data that you've given us with the real DHCP data that's on the network, with the real DNS data that's on that network. And when we start doing that comparison process, we can gain some real insight into that's garbage. That's not good anymore. You can't hide from DHCP. You can hide from IPAM, right? But you can't hide from DHCP. DHCP is real, and if it's not functioning properly, you have an outage immediately, right? So I have to know that that DHCP scope represents this subnet of whatever site or whatever size that it is accurately in whatever DHCP system that I'm using. And so when I go and I compare DHCP to the IPAM block, for example, and it's inaccurate or there's conflicts, DHCP wins out, right? Because DHCP is serving accurately against the routing tables that are on your networks right, or uh, against your, your routing infrastructure. And so we can go in, then we take that one step further and we compare that against the DNS data that you have. We could pretty much throw away your reverse space. To your point, the, uh, the PTR records, we're pretty much going to assume that they're garbage. Um, I'm, for all the folks out there that are your PTR infrastructure, your reverse space is accurate, I apologize. But for, and for most, it's inaccurate. And so we can discard most of that. We can discard the dynamic data itself. We know that the Active Directory or anything coming into DNS by way of DHCP is, we can throw it away because we'll recreate it. And now we've got a smaller subset of data to actually start from. And so if you'll think about, or if, you heard, if you've heard Blue Cat talk in, uh, in customer engagements or other conferences, we value that data as gold because we are, our end goal for us is to be the end all single source of truth and it must be accurate. So in any one of the migrations that we do, we focus on that data set as hard as we possibly can, scrub it clean, get it clean, get it in, and then work on the processes of whatever automation you're using, whatever processes you're manually using for requesting or doing administration, and now we will build ourselves into the single source of truth. To the discovery question, now we can go spot check in different areas of the network to ensure that we have the accurate IP space, and now we are the DNS, so we know that's accurate. Yes, sir. So a question about your offering. It sounds like you're not just selling a technology solution, but services to go with it? I wouldn't say services so much as we, we we, we're selling a solution, we're creating, let's say this way, we're not selling a solution, we're creating a solution, creating a solution with you based off of the needs of each individual or a corporation that we go work with, and then we are helping them to get there, right? So the services themselves, sure, if you want to call them services, we are engaging not only on the, uh, on the visibility side from our, what, the vision side, I should say, uh, and building the vision of Enterprise DNS, which is a specific story for every organization, helping you get there, and then we're staying engaged so that over the course of our time together, our partnership, if you will, as a vendor and customer, we're helping you uh, evolve, right, that DNS platform. So answered, I, you could say it's services. That answered the question because some of it was sounding like pre-sales strategy vision of yep. what the product can do for you, but then some of it is post-sale. Uh, yeah. Uh, how do I deploy this and get it to actually do what I intended? So, so uh, Noel and Kevin uh, manage our, they run our uh, solution architect organization. Um, and I'll let them speak for themselves in just a minute. But the things that we teach our pre-sales group to do is to understand what I'm talking about today, <laughs> which is creating solutions, not selling product not selling features or one-offs or direct integrations, but selling a vision, creating a vision, not selling a vision, but creating a vision with our corporations based off of the things that they're telling us. What our business has done in the last decade is changed our engagement model so that once that's done, we stay involved and we stay engaged throughout the lifetime of our partnership because especially in this era, into the enterprise DNS era, things are changing rapidly. And the DNS infrastructure, when I say DNS, I mean all three, they have to change as well. And we have to stay engaged to do that. And we have, we have um, invested a lot of time and effort and, um, and money, quite frankly, into, into building that engagement model. 
from our care organization to our pre-sales organization to our implementation organization, and quite frankly, into just uh, the business as a whole driving towards that engagement model. And then lastly, so as a defense in depth strategy for security, let me give you the visualization that I like to use when we talk about this. We're not going to replace security applications, hardware, solutions that you already have inside of your ecosystem. We wanna to add to it, and here's how we wanna to add to it. If you think about what enterprise DNS is, now that we've unified, we've become the single source of truth for the space, the namespace, the IP space, we can understand. Again, we have a 30,000 foot view of what the networks are. We have a very low level on the ground understanding of what uh, devices are on our network, and now through enhanced security, or through enhanced DNS, we can now understand the intention of those devices on your network through DNS. We can apply policy directly at the client facing level, which I'll get into in just a moment, right through DNS, right? With that, that is super valuable. And so you might be asking yourself, well, we do query logging. We use, we use a nice uh, vendor for capturing all those query logs that get sent over, right? That's great. That is very reactionary. I mean, quite frankly, 99% of the time they go into that data lake, they never come out, they never get analyzed, and certainly there is no ability to apply policy at the service level, at the service point level, which is client facing. Any questions on that? Because that's gonna open up a whole can of worms, I'm certain. Okay. Intelligent DNS. This is the other part of when we get down into what Blue Cat's vision is around DNS. What you're going to ask? What's the roadmap? What is Blue Cat thinking next? We're not thinking. Uh, one, I talked about enterprise DNS leveraging for cloud, leveraging for the challenges you have around cloud, leveraging for automation, time to compute, time to detect, a little bit of security in there. But this is really where we're moving, right? Intelligent DNS. And what does that mean? If you think about the analogy that Jim gave you a little while ago about about plumbing and pipes and water, right? Water has a very specific way to flow into your house or into your organization and out of your house. And so DNS was thought of as the same way. I've got a pipe, I'm gonna send information through that pipe, it's gonna go one way, that's it, right? But now what we're understanding is that organizations are facing some serious challenges where we need to make some decisions on how we answer queries, not just answer the queries. And so before it was, Hey, I need to know where Google is. Fine, here's where Google is. You're welcome for the plug, Google. Uh, hey, I need to know where whatever is, and so we'll answer that, right? But there's a whole lot of information in there that we can derive, and there's some decisions to be made. If you think about mergers and acquisitions, if you think about migrations, if you think about things like split horizon DNS, which is the oldest of these, where I've got the namespace the same on the inside as it is on the outside. Anybody know what I'm talking about, right? When Active Directory uh, came around, people thought, oh, that's a really good idea to name my Active Directory environment bluecatnetworks.com, right? Because that's what we had on the outside. And all of a sudden, I've created a split, a split brain or a split horizon situation for myself, and I've du uh, duplicated or doubled my administration of the, of the DNS that I have, right? It's a big problem. But it was one of the older problems. Now, we think about DNS as an intelligent routing mechanism to say, you know what? If you're destined for the internet, that's fine. Go out this pipe. If you're destined for authoritative DNS, go here. But you know what? That authoritative DNS might actually live in a couple of different places. And so if you think about the way that RFC standard DNS works, I'm gonna ask you a question about a particular host name and you're gonna answer me. And you might answer me with an NX domain, but you're gonna answer me, I'm gonna take your answer and I'm gonna have to take that answer. But what about if I do a, an acquisition of a company and I'm not yet ready to merge that data, but I still have the same namespace. Now I might have three or four different sources of authoritative information around that namespace. And so what we can do is say, can I have an answer? You'll give me an answer? Good, I'm good with that. Or if you say, nope, I don't have that answer, I can move to the second source or the third source or the fourth source and say, yep, these buckets of authoritative source of that information around that namespace might live in these different places. Right? And so that becomes a huge problem. Mergers and acquisitions is one. Migrations is another place that we can definitely solve that issue. And quite frankly, in the cloud, it's ever becoming a big, big issue, especially when we get into that conversation where uh, we've got to manage the DNS. And in some cases, we can't control the DNS and we don't exactly know where it is. So we might need to go find it 
Uh, and so our intelligent routing around DNS will help us with that. And definitely an internet breakout. So you've got your organizations are global, yet now SaaS is becoming super huge, right? So we've got uh, a lot of our uh, corporate services are moving out into the cloud. And I don't want to be here. I don't want to be across the ocean, rather, and have to come all the way back here to consume my SaaS based off the fact that I'm querying into my corporate DNS and it's giving me an answer in North America, but yet I'm over in Europe or I'm over in Asia or wherever. So internet breakout is a huge problem. We can solve that with intelligent DNS routing. Did you just say Office 365? I did not say Office 365, but I meant <laughs> Office 365. Again, I'm not trying to pick on Microsoft, I promise. Any, you know what, let me go back. Can you think of other use cases? for being able to intelligent, intelligently route DNS. These are what we hear from our customers, but. Guest networking, BYOD. Um, BY. Separate, BYOD, separate zones for different areas of the. That's one of them. Yeah, identity is definitely a big player for us. When I we mean, start talking. Kind of rolled up in there, but. Yep. Yeah. Anybody else? Proximity based routing, maybe, like. Depends on the user location. Okay, let me send the request to here and. Definitely so. Yeah, internet breakouts a, a big one for that for sure. Anybody else? Okay. Anycast. What about Anycast? What about Anycast? Yeah, Anycast is a great topic, right? And so um, when we talk about, and I, I did, I tried to incorporate Anycast into the flow of this talk, and I couldn't really fit it anywhere unless somebody brought it up, and we can definitely talk about it, but. Anycast is one of those things that is thought of generally in, in the conversations that I have as a DNS thing, right? And it's a routing thing, right? Anycast is, is absolutely routing. It did change resiliency um, of a DNS, of a DNS uh, ecosystem, right? But it presents its own challenges, right? Because it's not load balancing and it's not geo aware necessarily, right? It could be maybe. Um, if you configure your DNS to be geo aware, then Anycast could do that for you. For but that's definitely a good one. I should add it to the list. Map internet approach. Say again. You need to map everywhere. So that's that right. Work. Yeah, but Anycast is definitely a um, a great protocol. We really uh, we 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 we'd like any we like to use Anycast. Uh, we have to get around some of the challenges of using Anycast. Mm -hmm. But I think what you'll find is that um, the enterprise DNS ecosystem will, will rely more and more and more on both load balancing and Anycast in the future. I'm not giving away anything here, um, or do I know anything, but I believe Anycast is going to revolutionize some of these services well beyond what it's doing right now. So where do we fit? This is the, I think anytime we have talks, whether they're customer talks or presentations, or especially in front of a group of folks like this, where does Blue Cat fit? Right? Where are we in the ecosystem? One, we're a core service. 100%, no doubt, if what BlueCat provides or what these core services provide is down, your network's down. I don't care how fast your wireless is, your proxies are, your firewalls are, your routing and switching, don't really care how fast that is. If I can't get on the network through IP connectivity and I can't resolve to find out where my final destination is, the network is down from the client's perspective. Right? Who remembers the, uh, who rem sorry, Dine, who remembers the Dine outage? Right? Mm -hmm. So I live in Dallas. Uh, somebody else lives in Dallas, right? Um, I remember sitting on my couch. I was getting <coughs> ready for a presentation the next Tuesday. And I think that was October 19th or something like that. And I remember sitting on my couch on my laptop and I heard the newscaster, Channel 5, he goes, Internet's down. Like br global breaking news, the Internet's down. And I looked up and I went, What? What did you say? <laughs> like that is the most awesome statement ever. And what had happened was Dine had had an outage, right? And so with that, for the folks that were using that service at that time, <coughs> their services were down, right? But the newscaster, I mean, the, the global perception was, oh, the internet's down. So these are core services. We fit at the core services level of any organization. Specifically, where do we fit? Authoritative DNS, we're going to configure and we're going to spread across the organization to make sure that your, your corporate resources are mapped to appropriately through the namespace, but we fit right at the client edge, right? We are client facing. And so if you think about the disparate environments that we have today, you might have a variety of uh, different installations. Maybe you're using Bind, maybe you're using Microsoft, maybe you're using something else, right? And they're all over the place. Blue Cat One is 
trying to be unified or want to be, Enterprise DNS is the unification, but we were right at the client facing portion of the network. So the very first thing that a client's going to do is get an IP address from us. The second thing they're going to do when they try to do something is resolve against us, right? And so we're right up against the client. 